spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Beachside Roofing. Well, aloha and happy Monday. Thanks so much for tuning in with us here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and we want to thank all of you for starting off your week with us. Uh, you know, Yanji, obviously on this uh, program, we like to spotlight a number of issues that are happening. Of course, we've talked about COVID-19 and those alarming numbers that we continue to see. Uh, there's also concerns over Red Hill and, of course, what's happening there with the water. But today, we're going to be focusing on Aloha Stadium. Yeah, this could change the way a lot of folks live, work, and play in urban Honolulu and uh, would have an impact on all of us who love to attend activities and games at the stadium. We are welcoming this morning Chris Kinimaka, who is a Public Works Administration for Administrator for DAGS, which is the State Department of Accounting and General Services, along with Aloha Stadium Manager Ryan Andrews. Uh, both are working hard on the new Aloha Stadium Entertainment District, which we're going to be hearing a lot about in the coming years. Uh, Chris, Ryan, good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. So Chris, I want to start with you in terms of where we are in this project. Uh, we've been hearing rumblings about it for some time now, but give us a little bit of an overview on where we are right now. Well, thank you, Yunji. After decades of working on this project, we're so happy that we have our request for qualifications uh, issued for the real estate portion of our project. We have received solid proposals or qualifications, and they're currently being reviewed by our, evalu our evaluation committee so that we're going to be announcing the priority listed developers that are under consideration this coming January. So that is one huge milestone for us. We already had the request for qualifications go out for the stadium in 2020, and we had listed the priority listed respondents back in November of 2020. So we are preparing now to issue the request for proposals so that they can submit their actual design concepts and proposal uh, packages for us to review. Now we did announce last week, unfortunately, we missed our December 15th deadline to get that package to them, but that's because we're under solid review in the final steps and we're looking forward to issuing it no later than the end of January this coming year. So 2022. And so when can you, ex uh, so now we're looking at getting those RFPs uh, beginning in January, is that correct? Well, so issuing the request for proposals to the developers in January. Yes. Thank Got you. it. Okay. And, and when that process begins, I mean, what does that, what does the timeline look like after that? Once you get those proposals that come in, uh, I think a lot of people are just anticipating when in reality do we see this project actually begin and, you know, shovels in the ground, so to speak. Yeah, we're still on target to move forward for the developers to go through the process, work with us stakeholders in the community to submit their final proposals and going through evaluation. We're targeting the award by the end of next year so that we'll see action for both the real estate and the stadium projects in 2023. Not that far away. And Ryan, uh, from your perspective, what do you hope the new stadium will look like and how will, be, how will it be different than the one we have now? Yeah, great question. I think one of the big differences is it will be a, a true multi-use uh, venue, whereas today some of our challenges include the fact that our field is so narrow, we can't actually adequately host um, rugby or soccer events with a regulation size field. So that alone will be a big positive in terms of being able to now attract you know, professional soccer, professional rugby on, on regulation size fields. The other couple features, um, we're trying to really target concerts. And so we're trying to make this stadium a concert ready stadium, meaning having the, you know, rigging in place so that we can um, easily set up, you know, light speakers, so on and so forth, uh, and make it a, a much uh, less expensive proposal for a lot of these major concerts that travel. And then lastly, just being a modern stadium having all the amenities you'd expect in a modern stadium, such as the, the premium seating, the suite, the club spaces, uh, just the better food experience overall. So there's a lot of um, really positive things to look forward to. 
you know, when we look at just uh, the plan and the overall proposal, of course, there is the stadium aspect of it, and there's this all, all this entertainment, uh, you know, district, so to speak, that will be also included within the scope of the project. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk us through of what that process, uh, Chris, would look like in getting that started. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned the process for the stadium, but uh, what is the uh, surrounding uh, the entertainment district and look like in, in that timeline? I think if we consider that the project is being broken out into two segments, we have the stadium occupying roughly 23 acres of the site in anticipation, which would leave about 70 to 75 acres for real estate development. When we work with a developer, we want to see an overall master plan that embodies that whole transit oriented development, live, work, play, thrive type of environment with an entertainment theme. So we're going to work with the developers to work in phases. We're not going to give them the whole 75 acres all at once. We want to see them work so that we can absorb all of the development in the market as we go along. So we don't want, for example, empty facilities. But in the whole bigger picture, we are looking at residential uses, commercial and real estate, and even a lot of community spaces for gathering, for businesses, for um, really embodying education and cultural opportunities as well. So we anticipate the developers would want to develop probably at the area closest to the Hart Rail Station and adjacent to the stadium to get us started off very quickly. Thank you. The, per the graphic, that is the real estate portion that is highlighted now with the actual station at the very top of the picture behind the stadium and closest to Pearl Harbor. So we anticipate development starting from that end of the property and then migrating Malka towards IA Elementary, which is the area closest to us and then expanding out to the south, and that's to the left of the graphic. And that would make sense in the essence of how to bring in revenue to help sustain the current district and move forward for future development. And diving a little deeper into that graphic, I'm interested to know about the mix of housing that you're hoping to put in there. There's been some conversations, of course, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a moment, that um, that some people are pushing for this district to be fully focused on housing. But what do you think the housing plans that are uh, in consideration right now, who's actually going to live there and, uh, and what's it going to cost? We're looking more at workforce housing, and that embodies the income of people that would be essential to the community. So your firefighters, your educators, um, the people who we want to really strengthen the community and truly be able to live, work and play in the area. So that would cover a broad spectrum, though. So when we say res residential workforce housing, it's a mix. It'll include affordable housing. It'll include some market housing. And that's something that we'd work very closely with developers on. Uh, what you're showing now is a very interesting graphic because we've heard many proposals to fill the entire site with 20,000 affordable housing units. Our team decided to see what that looks like. And so this graphic shows 20,000 units. We estimated 1,000 square feet each, but that includes 400 square feet for parking space and the rest would be for general circulation. And the unit itself is just under 500 square feet per unit. But the way to look at this is all of the colors you see, for example, on the left, the red shows the, the height limitation per the TOD transit zoning. So on the left-hand side, that is the, um, the section on Kamehameha Highway, for example, at a 250 foot height limit, you'll see the apartments would exceed that height limit. As you go around to the green portion, uh, that's 150 foot height limit, the towers exceed that as well. And then off to the right, 90, 90 foot height limit, and that's closer to the communities, all being exceeded just to fit 20,000 units. And if you look at that, that's in our concept, that's not really live, work, play. It's not really a, an environment that seeks to blend in with the community. And that's our goal is to allow the community back into the area covered by asphalt right now. So that it's more like the old town back in Moili'ili when you had the Honolulu Stadium where people would come early and stay late. You would eat and hang out in the district and really blend in with the community and invite the outside in 24 seven. So um, that's what we're looking at. And, uh, one of the things we wanted to make, and I'm sorry to stick this in, but people are talking about the $350 million price tag to develop this stadium and the whole district, which we're committed to staying within. 
no one's asked how much it costs to build 20,000 affordable housing units. We're just, we did our own estimates at a rough $300 a square foot. You're speaking about $6 billion to build that much affordable housing. Where is that gonna come from? And how is that going to be subsidized? So what we're proposing in our district with roughly 3,000 residential units, it could be more, you know, de depending how developers get the revenue to generate, that would be self-sustaining and our programs would help bring in money for the rest of the state for other programs elsewhere. So really when you talk about price tags, I just wanted to stick that in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and Ryan, I'm wondering if you can share a little about what the reaction has been from the community about this project moving forward. I mean, you guys have had a number of community meetings. You've had the opportunity to hear about what they want uh, the future Aloha Steam to look like and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, what has been the general consensus and what have you heard from the community? You know, we, we've been engaged with the community for many years on this project and they are enthused about the, this concept, this idea. Um, they have also voiced their opinions on affordable housing as well. And, and although everyone agrees that affordable housing is uh, an important issue for the state, I think everyone also agrees that it shouldn't be just solved with this, this one project alone. And it's something that's really island-wide and statewide and um, affordable housing should be spread, you know, across the entire 21 mile uh, rail line that's being um, being built now and, and, and kind of goes in line with the whole TOD plan. So I think there's a lot of excitement in the community. They have been very involved. They've come to our different community meetings. They've put in their input in terms of both district um, as well as stadium, what they'd like to see. You know, Chris, following up on that, with this conversation that has been um, sort of spearheaded by the former governors, Wahei, Abercrombie, and Cayetano, um, just sort of what's your response to that initiative, to, to them saying that a sports facility is not a good use of um, public or private funds? Why is a stadium a good investment? Well, for us, it's the largest venue that's available, not just for singular games, but really it's a community asset. And it's a gem for the whole district. We do need a venue of this ilk, not just for football, which we embrace, but other entertainment venues and for uh, things like the Great Aloha Run and your high school football games. You know, and the community really invests their time here. We are looking for bringing residents in and making it an overall gathering place for all kinds of events and activities. And so with the stadium here, you can bring in international events and really help Hawaii be connected to the whole world. And within a big district, it's something that will bring financial benefit to the whole state. So we think the stadium is much more than just a venue for, for example, seven football games. And I'll, and I'll add on to that, Chris, because I think right now is an interesting time where we see the need. So right now we have the high school state football championships going on. And unfortunately, with our venue uh, not operable, it's, it's been moved to Farrington High School, which I think holds, you know, three to four thousand people. And so next week you have Kahuku playing St. Louis and Kahuku alone can bring 10,000 people. So we need a venue to support a wide variety of events and it really to serve as a gathering place, as Chris mentioned. And there are a lot of other community events that um, unfortunately right now we can't um, we can't take care of. But with the new stadium, we will be able to. You know, when speaking with the former governors uh, on this program about this topic, one of the other criticisms that they said was that the University of Hawaii would be, uh, you know, one of the tenants, so to speak, that, uh, you know, an organization that would be obviously utilizing this field for the football games, uh, but they just have not been involved in the process. I'm wondering, Ryan, if you can speak to, and Chris, if you want to follow up after, you know, what do you see the University of Hawaii's role in the planning stages, but once a you know a bid is approved and things begin moving forward, uh, how involved would the University of Hawaii be in this process? Well, first of all, I, I will say Hawaii is Hawaii University of Hawaii is our is our main partner, and we do um, anticipate them in new stadium. They have been somewhat involved, and in fact, they're um, they have a permanent seat on our stadium authority board for one, and then number two, I'm I'm working regularly with uh, athletic director David Matlin. Uh, on issues around NASET, as well as their future use agreement in the new stadium. So uh, they have been involved and we wanna see their continued involvement moving forward, of course. And I'll add too that when we start with the prior list of respondents on the RFP, we're gonna allow them to meet with all the key stakeholders and UH will definitely be number one on the list to talk about what we're looking for in the stadium to support our needs. 
Um, you know, Chris, there's a lot of hesitation with a big public works projects like, like this. I think people are soured because of the rail project and they want assurances that the money will be spent wisely and that we're not going to see deficits. You know, now rail, we're looking at the billions of dollars of deficits and the project costs have just ballooned over time. Um, talk a little bit about the state investment. You know, I know that this is a public private partnership from the start, which is very different than how the rail project has sort of progressed. But um, how much public money are you anticipating receiving for this project and, and where was the rest going to come from? Thank you, Yunji. So we've get, gotten a promise from the legislature back in 2019 for $350 million. It was in a different mix of sources of funds. And at that time, we weren't able to use about $180 million of it because there were revenue bonds. But over the time, as all the legislative bills have had to progress, we do look forward to that commitment being met this coming year. We are not going to ask for more than $350 million in total from the state for the investment for what we're looking at being far more closer to a billion dollars for the whole district. So that is our commitment. And that's what we've been working on very diligently for the last year and a half, especially through COVID-19, to make sure that we can still make this balanced budget work with the plan. And so a portion of the funding would go straight into paying for the stadium, but a portion of that would go into infrastructure and helping make sure that we have the funds available to not only build a stadium and start development for the real estate, but also to maintain the stadium. And then over time, when you look at the big picture, we're looking at revenue to be able to support not just the district, but other state programs. So we have a very robust team actively and diligently working on this. And that is the last piece that we're working with budget and finance to secure, to issue our request for proposals. Another thing that this project uh, has brought up is the overall seating capacity and what size would be the appropriate size. Of course, we know at 50,000 seats right now, uh, you know, the stadium obviously would be much smaller uh, in this new proposal. Ryan, I'm wondering if you can share with us the thought process behind, um, you know, seating capacity and if that that is a conversation that's still happening or have things uh, pretty much been solidified with the type of occupancy you're looking for for this new stadium? No, no that's a great question. And we are uh, still tightening that down a little bit, but we have done um, a handful of market studies that have really helped us narrow that down. So 50,000 is, is too large. So we're looking at more the sweet spot of around 30,000 seat capacity. And that would handle um, you know, everything that we have today and, and including all those events that we hope to attract in the future. It's kind of the sweet spot that we're aiming for. And let's, uh, Chris, if you could tell us a little bit more about the timeline. So we've got the stadium, obviously that's priority number one, and then the re residential housing uh, and, and the entertainment venues and all the retail that we talked about. How long before the whole thing is done? Uh, and, and what are the sort of phases, if you will? So with the stadium and the real estate development, hopefully being able to work in tandem in 2023, we see the stadium having to go through with the developers, you know, their own design process, which we estimate would take roughly about a year and then another couple of years for construction. So from the groundbreaking period, roughly three years for the stadium to be done. And right last step with that would be the real estate development as well. Over time, we're saying that we would see roughly three phrases, excuse me, three phases of real estate development, each one taking about five years. So say phase one would happen between the stadium and the heart station. And that's just our concept. That's up to the developer. That would take about five years. The next increment would roll in between years five and 10 and then 10 to 15 or 15 to 20. All said, we're not expecting the whole district to be happening overnight. I think a lot of people are afraid that they're going to see, for example, tailgating disappear, but we're not going to use all 98 acres until year 15 to 20. So there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of adjusting that will happen over time at the end of the whole tail, probably 15 to 20 years. You know, as we talk about the football and the use of the stadium, we know that the stadium is used for a variety of other um, events and things that are happening, including right now, you know, there's the uh, Christmas light show that's happening. The parking lot also gets used for uh, the 58th State Fair. There's a farmer's market that happens. So there's a lot that happens in the surrounding area that would also be impacted by this. I'm wondering, uh, Ryan, how long do you think some of those events would continue to be able to utilize the parking lot and um, what would happen to them 
once things get going? I mean, is, is the farmer's market something that is also included in the plans? And what happens to some of those other events that utilize the stadium outside of the stadium itself? That's a great question. And, and as Chris said, you know, we're looking at a 15, 20 year window, but the, the swap meet, which I guess you're referencing as the farmer's market, the swap meet is a critical program for us and it's a huge chunk of our revenue. And so we have, um, so obviously have to shift or adjust in the beginning while construct, construction is taking place, but it will be a requirement of the real estate developer to find them a new home in the district. So it might not look exactly like you see today, but that swap meet will continue into the future. They are part of the NACED program. Um, and, and Ryan, just to follow up, um, on, you know, on the on, on the sport, on the venue itself, um, what kind of interest have you received from leagues? I know there was uh, when we had the former governors on, they said, you know, the thinking had been for many years, if you build it, they will come and they never did. What will be different about this facility? Yeah, that's a great question, too. And we have received um, a lot of interest, uh, primarily from um, professional rugby, as well as the United Soccer League, professional soccer league. The big difference is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that it's a it's a stadium field that can actually um, use regulation size field so they can be accommodated here. And it has all the requirements that they need in the field. And so rugby has what they call a reg 22, which is a special regulation for the field turf. So this stadium will accommodate that. So I think those are the, the big differences of the fact that the existing stadium just didn't accommodate those events. We are excited. The USL um, proposal is, is extremely exciting to me. Uh, for a bunch of reasons. Number one is they're proposing um, franchises here, so a permanent residence here, and not just one, but they want to do a men's and a women's franchise. So I know, um, you know, gender equity in sport isn't a radical idea, but USL is on the front end of that, ensuring that they do provide that to their athletes. And these aren't just teams that they're, you know, sending in just to play here and leave. These are people that will be, you know, part of our community and involved not only in um, soccer, but also in youth sports and things like that. So it's an exciting proposal. That's also a league that, um, if you don't mind me expanding on it, they're, all their games are you know televised on ESPN3, which opens up some opportunities for us in terms of additional advertising and, and branding in our stadium. And then soccer is also a unique one because soccer is a two hour fixed window, you know, unlike football that can stretch for three to four hours. So typically your soccer fans, you know, they come early, so they're going to participate in the district. They'll probably come and eat, have drinks, then go to the game. It's a two hour fixed window and then they leave. They might, you know, stick around and continue on in their evening and, and make it an enjoyable experience overall. So soccer is a neat opportunity that uh, we just haven't had in the past. And it's something that we really are looking at strongly right now. Well, and I think if I can add, Ryan, really they're saying that they're going to have 20 games average a year for men's and 20 games average a year for the women's. And that doesn't include exhibitions and the fact that they want to outreach to our youth to get them actively involved in soccer. So that's a very exciting uh, opportunity and AYSO is huge in Hawaii. So I look forward to that for our, our kids. You know, in this next process, as uh, you mentioned, we, uh, the stadium will wait to get, uh, put the proposals out there and wait for those to come in. I'm, I'm wondering, is there any clear, expectation or indications of how many different proposals that you uh, you will be receiving? Has there been uh, much uh, interest from designers and companies out there who are interested in this project? We have three uh, right now that we shortlisted developers that are just waiting in the wings and, you know, chomping at the bit to get the proposal information. So through three very solid teams, they can propose a basic plan and additional creative op opportunities. So we are looking for some very solid concepts from these three teams. It's all very exciting. I, I know that the public, um, you know, has been sort of watching and you did say that you're doing a bunch of public meetings but for, for folks who are sort of just waking up to this project. How can the public get involved and make sure that they're part of the process as well? The biggest start is to um, check out the neighborhood board meetings. We are there every single month for AIA and for the Aliomanu, so it's neighborhood board 18 and 20, and for the AIA community association meetings. We also ha have our nasa.hawaii.gov website where we announce events that are coming up. We'll definitely contact all of you in the media to make sure the word is out to come and you know, join with us and our developers. So we wanna hear from you. You know, as we wrap up here, we did want to allow each of you the opportunity to have some final thoughts. Uh, maybe Ryan, we'll start off with you. You know, uh, as we wrap up this conversation, there still is, uh, there still are those out there to say in the community that are a little hesitant about 
spending the money uh, on this stadium and the project as a whole. Uh, what is your message out there to those who may still be skeptical about this project overall and, and why you feel that this is the best path forward? Well, I'll give you a couple, and I guess I may be stealing this from Senator Wakai, but he always says the state is land rich and cash poor. And here we have an opportunity where right now we just have a stadium surrounded by a parking lot that sits, you know, dark most days of the week. And here we have an opportunity to develop that land um, to obviously get lease payments uh, for that land. And we can activate this district and energize this district so that it's um, exciting to be here seven days a week, not just, you know, one or two days a week. So to me, that's the exciting portion. And I think also just having that place, a gathering site for the state where people can come. And if they want to come to an event at the stadium, they can. But if they just want to enjoy other aspects of the district, whether that's, you know, shopping or restaurants or even just a community park or museum that we have on site, it just opens up the window for a lot of fun opportunities. And as I mentioned earlier, it's generating revenue that over time can be put into other you know, priorities for the state. And Chris, your final thought here this morning? Well, just, you know, piggybacking on what Ryan said, it is very exciting to see the opportunity for us to take the stadium property that right now divides the community from the Malka side to the Makai side and break down the fences, take away all the asphalt and build the community back in. So we're looking at bringing grid streets, bringing in a lot of gathering and educational opportunities, as we said, and just for, you know, overall retail, commercial, and residential uses, it's a chance to give back to IAEA what they've given to the state for all of the other projects that they've absorbed in their district. And in this way, we want to bring value back and welcome in all of the neighbors. So again, the big message we have is come out. If you have questions, come through. We're transparent. We answer them to the best that we can. We're not hiding anything. And we do want to hear your ideas because this is going to be your gem that we present to you for the next 20 years and beyond. Thank you. Well, Chris Kinimaka and Ryan Andrews, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. I know we'll be talking about this project, it sounds like, for many years to come. And we do welcome you to join us again in a few months to give us an update on those RFPs. We'll be excited. Thank you. For the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, great to hear from them both and very interesting, especially when, uh, Ryan, you threw up those renderings to see what this area could look like. I mean, uh, you know, Ryan had a great point there that this is an area that, you know, many nights and many days just sits dark. And the idea that you could have tens of thousands of housing units along with a new sports facility seating, what he said sounds around like 30,000, uh, he said was the sweet spot. Um, obviously, it's going to take up to two decades to complete, but in the meantime, we could see a lot of changes coming to that area, uh, including a lot of housing, which uh, I know is something that everyone in the community says is, is very much needed. And something that the former governors uh, have spoken about, saying that this should be an area used for housing. And interesting to see that graphic that they shared that really highlighted what it would look like in order to make that a reality and turning that area into um, a housing district, affordable housing district for the number of houses uh, and, and units that they have proposed, uh, showing that it does not look like a, a facility that would be a live work play type of environment, but more of just uh, structures of buildings. I thought that was pretty eye opening to see what that realistically looks like on that piece of land. Uh, you also heard from them of what they're expecting to get in uh, the timeline, in, so to speak, of how this project will map out over the years. It will be some time for the entire district to be completed, but with the focus uh, solely on the stadium at first to get that up and running, because we know that, uh, you know, that is probably the, the key po portion of this entire project. And the University of Hawaii obviously will just be playing at home on their modified campus uh, stadium right now until that time is, uh, you know, until the stadium is ready. Yeah, and you also heard them really distinguishing themselves from the public, a big public works project like rail. This is a true public-private partnership that is very different uh, than the rail project. They're saying that they're going to stick to that $350 million public investment, uh, and also that eventually this will be revenue generating, and so that, that that really makes it very different than the rail project. I think, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that the public is uh, a little, you know, has some trepidation about investing big money into big projects like this, but they're really saying that this is revenue generating, that this will be uh, having a lot of private money invested in there, uh, so it will be very different. We are looking forward to seeing those RFPs in January. Uh, she did say that there are three 
key developers that they are uh, have shortlisted, if you will. So we hope to see more detailed plans in the months to come. But very interesting to get that update and to see where that project is heading. It really could change. You know, it's funny because when you think about the stadium site, it used to feel that it was so far out. And now it really feels like it would be great to have housing that close to urban Honolulu. Yeah, at this point in time, in, in this day and age, you know, everybody's just looking for land, it seems like. And uh, obviously, that will be a big part of this overall overall master plan and the overall components, as, as well as hearing uh, the interest from outside organizations and the fact that a professional sports team uh, could utilize that stadium as well. I think that is something that a lot of people would like to see uh, is a uh, staple and a, a named brand, so to speak, that will occupy that facility as well. Yeah, men and women's teams, that would be fantastic for youth in Honolulu and also just, you know, kids around the state and adults, too, who enjoy watching professional sports games. So we will stay on this story. And like we said, we'll be talking about it likely for years to come. Uh, in the short term, focusing on Wednesday, we have Ikaika Anderson, who is a lieutenant governor uh, candidate. Uh, he has announced, of course, his candidacy running for the LG's race, former city council member, a familiar face to many. Why does he want that job and what is his campaign? campaign platform. We'll be discussing that with him, followed by UH political uh, science professor emeritus and political analyst Neil Milner. He'll be breaking down the LG's race and the governor's race. So we'll welcome both of those guests right here on Wednesday at 1030. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Beachside Roofing.